Bye. Good evening, everyone. I'm Hannah Weissman, Executive Director of the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. Thank you so much for coming out tonight uh, for the Center for Jewish Studies Annual Pell Lecture. Before we get started, I just wanted to ask you to please silence any devices you have with you. Notice our emergency exits. We have one at the front and one at the back of the room. And to thank you all for coming and engaging with us. If you're new to the Magnus, uh, our museum collections reflect global Jewish life. And if you're returning, thank you very much for continuing to engage with us. It's my pleasure to introduce Ethan Katz, who will be introducing our distinguished speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? No. OK, can everybody hear me now? Um, yeah, so I, my name's Ethan Katz. For those who don't know me, I teach in the Center for Jewish Studies in the History Department. Um, I'm the uh, faculty director for something called the Anti-Semitism Education Initiative, uh, which is a major program uh, under the Center for Jewish Studies, uh, where we put on a whole series of programs throughout the year on anti-Semitism education. We also do workshops for students, uh, faculty, and staff, uh, and we're actually called upon to do a lot of education work for other campuses, uh, and very excited to welcome uh, tonight's speaker. The uh, Pell Lecture uh, is always one of the major programs each year for the Center for Jewish Studies, and specifically for the Anti-Semitism Education Initiative. Uh, I want to thank uh, specifically the Joseph and Ida Pell Endowment for sponsoring this evening and for uh, this annual uh, Pell Lecture that they sponsor each year, as well as a number of other important programs at the CJS. The story of the blood libel uh, is always one of the things that mystifies people, I think, more than almost anything uh, when we talk about the history of anti-Semitism, uh, which I spend a lot of my time doing these days. And uh, whenever I'm presenting uh, anti-Semitic tropes historically, I always feel like I have to stop when I get to the blood libel and you know acknowledge that it seems so like this preposterous uh, thing, this idea that uh, Jews uh, murdered Christian children and uh, used their blood for ritual purposes. Uh, and it always seems like something that's really hard to explain. And what's even harder to explain is its persistence, right? So I end up usually saying this seems preposterous, but it has been remarkably uh, persistent over time. Um, I'm glad that I'm not uh, asked to explain how it's been so persistent over time, at least until uh, I've read uh, Magnus' book, because in fact, it, it is really kind of a difficult thing to explain and, and a mystery uh, for scholars, uh, which is one of the reasons that uh, her work is so remarkable and important. Uh, and it's something that comes up in all kinds of uh, historical contexts, right? Uh, much closer to our own time, uh, the Damascus blood libel of 1840 is something that I teach about a lot because I teach about uh, Jews of the Islamic world a lot, and that's the moment where we often say that European anti-Semitism is really introduced into the Middle East, into uh, the Islamic world, uh, is through this blood libel case in Damascus in 1840, uh, which itself is in some ways still uh, shrouded in uh, mystery. Uh, and much more recently, the, the accusations of blood libel uh, and sometimes intimations of blood libel uh, can be much abused in contemporary conversations uh, about Jews, about Israel, uh, about anti-Semitism. Uh, and so it's a, it's a subject that continues to haunt us to the present uh, and that really demands the kind of scholarly attention uh, that Magda has given it in her recent book. Um, so we're very fortunate to have uh, tonight's speaker, Magda Tedder, here. She is professor of history and the uh, Spidler Chair of Judaic Studies at Fordham University. Um, she is uh, previously the author of uh, two important books before the book that she's going to be talking about tonight, uh, Jews and Heretics in Catholic Poland, uh, published uh, by Cambridge University Press in 2006, uh, and Sinners on Trial, published by Harvard University Press in 2011, uh, which was a finalist for uh, the Jordan Schnitzer Prize, a very important book prize given by the Association for Jewish Studies. The book she's talking about tonight, uh, Blood Libel, on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth, 
uh, published in 2020, um, has uh, been the recipient already of uh, at least three major prizes, a National Jewish Book Award, uh, the George L. Mossa Prize in, in Cultural History from the American Historical Association, and the Bainton Prize from the 16th Century Society. Uh, and despite the fact that it feels to me that the ink is still drying on the blood libel, she still uh, has managed to write a new book in the interim, uh, which is about to come out, which also sounds really exciting, which I learned about uh, over coffee this morning, um, which is called Christian Supremacy, Reckoning with the Roots of Anti-Semitism and Racism, uh, and which I think promises to really bring a lot of needed attention to the relationship historically between um, anti-black racism and anti-Semitism in a variety of historical contexts. Uh, she is also very active uh, publicly, uh, writing for places like the Huffington Post, the New York Review of Books, uh, Public Seminar, uh, and elsewhere, and uh, creating what is, to my knowledge, perhaps the most active uh, Jewish studies program in the country, measuring by weekly programming at Fordham, uh, which is really impressive. Uh, she's also the recipient of a number of prestigious fellowships, including uh, the Guggenheim, uh, I, should, I should say both the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation fellowships. Uh, and she's been a visiting scholar at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard, uh, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, uh, as well as the recipient of an NEH fellowship. She has served as co-editor of the AGF Review, uh, and is Vice President for Publications of the Association for Jewish Studies. She told me today that she's actually very diligent about getting enough sleep, which is very hard for me to believe when I read her uh, list of work uh, and accomplishments. Um, she is also currently the President of the American Academy for Jewish Research. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Magda to Berkeley. Uh, please join me in coming to Thank you so much for this introduction, and uh, thank you for um, for uh, sparing me from asking you whether you know what blood libel is, uh, because now you know. Uh, I don't know that everybody would know um, what what it is. So it may sound uh, strange, but I didn't want to write this book. <laughs> and I'll give you the proof of why I didn't want to write this book. When I was finishing my book before that, I had a little bit of time. That's, can everybody hear me? OK. I had a little bit of time in the Vatican archives where I was, was doing research. And nerd that I am, I didn't go around Rome and looked at sites. I said, well, I don't want to waste the time, so let me pull some files just to look at them. So I knew of the existence of the um, trial records of Jews in the city of Trenton, the town of Trenton, 1475, that they were in the Vatican archive. I had the call number, I pulled the file, and then I wrote what it was. I just, I always take notes. I said, you know, this is a beautiful manuscript in parchment, 120 folios, that are not useful for me, but need to have seen. This is my proof. I didn't want to write this book. I didn't intend to write this book. But I ended up writing this book. But it wasn't the book that I, uh, the book that you, uh, I'm talking about wasn't the book that I intended to write, even when I finally started thinking about the uh, idea of, of blood libel and this. So this is uh, what I proposed or I thought about in 2011. Uh, and, and the first chapter was only six chapters. It was a small little book probably written fast and easy. We wouldn't be here because nobody would be talking about it, probably. But you can see that, that Trent was just an afterthought. It was just part of a medieval, medi uh, you know, not a very uh, central, um, central topic. Then, as I followed sources, uh, where they led me, um, the book grew. And then now it's this volume that it is. Uh, right now with 10 chapters and an epilogue. Um, the, the book essentially in the initial uh, concept was to explain this map, uh, why in the early modern period from late 16th century until the end of the 18th century, the anti-Jewish accusations uh, of Jews killing Christian, against Jews of killing, supposedly killing Christian children was taking place in Eastern Europe, of what used to be the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, 
uh, and in you know a couple of cases in 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 Italy. Uh, that was the, the idea of comparing uh, Eastern Europe, which is what my specialty was, and, uh, and, uh, and Italy. And as a scholar of the early modern period, um, we often sort of say, oh, nobody wants to read about something that's not modern. Everybody is interested in about modern uh, stuff, and nobody wants to re read our things. Well, it's be careful what you wish for. Because as my book was going into production, um, a shooting took place in California near San Diego in, near, in Poway, in which the shooter cited Simon of Trent, uh, the character in my book, it turned out, uh, saying, you are not forgotten, Simon of Trent, the horror that you and countless children have endured at the hands of the Jews will never be forgiven. And there I was in 2019, a book that I thought had no, not much any way relevance in 21st century America. After my book came out, literally a month after it, it appeared, uh, a, a painting was released in Italy, this, uh, this painting by a known and, and a talented devotional painter in Italy that had to be condemned by the Bishop Ambrogio Sperafico uh, for its uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic content, and the bishop f was forced to make a statement about the, uh, uh, the false accusations against Jews uh, that were made over centuries for them killing uh, Christian children. Um, this whole thing is about this uh, story of Simon of Trent, that is a boy whose body, a, a, a toddler whose body was found under a Jewish home uh, during the Eastern Passover uh, season in 1475, and which resulted in the uh, essentially destruction and end of the Jewish, small Jewish community in the now northern Italian town uh, of Trento. Um, all the men were arrested, uh, tortured, and then eventually executed. Women were arrested and uh, put in, under house arrest with children and eventually converted to, uh, to Christianity. Um, and it became clear as, as, uh, as I was finishing and as I was uh, writing the, the, um, the introduction that this the story that seemed to be old had still resonance. Uh, here is a Facebook page that was devoted to, quote, ritual murder that was uh, eventually uh, uh, removed in 2018 after four years of the uh, Anti-Defamation League's request from Facebook. Uh, in 2015, the British uh, movement at the Lincoln Cathedral met and uh, to, to uh, pay tribute to Lincoln, Hugh of Lincoln, um, again, boy uh, who was, uh, whose death resulted in the uh, prosecution and persecution of Jews of Lincoln in um, 1255. And of course, I was aware of uh, the Middle Eastern use of the blood libel motif um, in cartoons. But, the, but those instances were not my guiding principle in, uh, in trying to write this book. It, but it, it, with, the, with the Poe shooting, it became clear that this is, this is still an active uh, and resonating libel myth that continues to, to have a meaning. So typically, the blood libel is seen as a medieval story, as a medieval libel, as a medieval accusation. And uh, many, um, uh, many maps, many scholars sort of look at, at put, put dots on the map and saying this is where things, uh, where things happen. As I was writing the book and as we were, my husband and I were preparing the map for the publication of the book, I felt very uncomfortable with this kind of static depiction of with dots on the map because it means that they sort of tell you as if there were facts that, that these things happen. And what, we, what my research 
on the history of this accusation of this lie made me realize that there were places where these accusations took place. So there are facts of Jews being accused, but not all stories that are told are necessarily actual facts or events that took place. So the, um, the, we created a, 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 a website, the blood libel trail.org where you, can, you have an interactive maps including also other in iconography here. So this shows you very nicely, the, uh, answers the question whether these libels were in fact medieval accusations. And you can see that the majority of them, the, the, about two dozen more or less in the medieval period, the majority of them come to us from literary sources. That is, we know them from stories. We don't know them that they actually happened, that they took place. We sometimes know that these legends were created later on and retrofitted into a different thing. But on maps, they look as dots as if they happen and they become facts. Stories become seen as, as, uh, as facts. Um, but the, the trials uh, or the stories are by comparison with the so-called early modern period, which for us historians means mid 15th century until the end of the 18th century, it becomes clear that this is not necessarily a medieval story, that this is in fact an early modern story. And in the narrative that historians have produced was that, oh, this is a medieval accusations, and you probably see in the media sometimes the use of medieval as this sort of dark ages of intolerance and, and hatred, uh, and then we have the, the progress towards our modern times of, of tolerance. In fact, um, oops, going back, uh, this is an early modern story. It's not in terms of, only in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality. That is, the sources that come to us are majority of legal sources. That is, we actually know Jews were accused of such things, and they were uh, tried and they sometimes were tortured and they sometimes, not always, as we'll see in a moment, were executed. The literary stories are in a minority. This is very different from the medieval and the, the early modern. And here you have a, 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 an example of the, the map of whether there were legal proceedings or not. So in the early modern period, you can see that the majority we know of no even trace, not even in the tales that there were some sort of legal proceedings. Uh, this is not necessarily the case for the early modern period. So the accusations, the blood libel as an accusation in the real sense where real people are suffering and are affected by it is a product of the so-called early modern period, 15th century on. In fact, the, er, the medieval period is a period of, of condemnation of these accusations. The popes, the emperors in the medieval period condemned accusation, condemned Christians of accu accusing Jews, for accusing Jews of such uh, things. Uh, and here we have a list of these, uh, of these condemnations from the 13th century until the last one in 1544. In terms of the, uh, the again, the, the, the period where you have uh, the period between uh, when the, the popes were in fact condemning them, you see that there are some legal, uh, legal proceedings. And then, uh, again, the, the numbers are different after the popes stop condemning these accusations, after there are no longer public figures who are uh, uh, officially and publicly condemning such anti-Jewish libels. Um, and yet, there was another interesting question is that if, you know, if I did a random survey of people who know a little bit about blood libels or the so-called ritual murders, uh, they probably think about the outcomes that Jews were uh, were executed as a result of that, just as the Jews were in Trento. 
But when you look at the, the historical sources, in the majority, Jews were actually not executed. Not all anti-Jewish accusations ended up with the condemnations of Jews. So the question was why we think in the popular, in the sort of popular understanding and even in historiography, uh, we think of that as ending for Jews in that, uh, in that uh, uh, lethal way. And the reason of that is that it is the trials or, or stories that ended with Jews being condemned that are publicized, that are written about, that are um, disseminated especially by those who, in whose interest it was to condemn Jews or to prove that Jews were doing it. The trials in which Jews were acquitted or which never made it to trial, accusations that were submitted to courts but never made it to trial, were of no interest to being publicized because it, it meant that these, it, it complicated these, um, these, these stories, these anti-Jewish stories. Uh, and the only example where these are um, uh, noted that Jews were not prosecuted is when the anti-Jewish writers wanted to say that Jews bribed the officials. So that are the only kind of examples to, to that even note of the fact that Jews had defenders and were not, uh, not accused. But the point is not always, not uh, did everybody um, believe in these stories and there were always defenders of Jews in each case including um, uh, uh, deeming them innocent. So why 15th century on we have this, this sudden shift in quantity and quality of these accusations? And the answer is Simon of Trent, the story of Simon of Trent. Not the first one and not the last one as we've seen from the maps. Um, so after the, the boy disappears at the beginning, people think that he drowned. The Trento has a lot of canals uh, and, and two different rivers uh, sort of connected in that area. So at the beginning, people thought that, that Simon sim simply fell into one of the canals and drowned. But then with time, rumors began to circulate that per, this, it's Passover and perhaps Jews had, had done this. Their houses were searched, nothing was found, but then his body washed up under the house of, of a Jewish family on Easter Sunday. They dutifully notified the authorities that the body of the boy was found, and then they were arrested, and then the trial took place. The narrative, however, of what supposedly had happened was already set a few days after their arrest, before the full trial even took place, before any confessions were made, before torture was applied. Um, this, the, the interest was in making the Simon a martyr. Why? 1475 was a jubilee year, and a lot of pilgrims were, were going to Rome uh, for the jubilee. And the Bishop of Trento wanted them to stop by. And we now create different tourist attractions, but in the er medieval and early modern period, pilgrimage sites were this kind of tourist attraction. So he um, began to promote the story of Simon and his supposed martyrdom at the hands of Jews through the new media technology that just emerged a few decades early, I know decades seems like a long time, but in that period of time, decades is not as fast as, as it is for us. But they were living in the middle of a media revolution. The printing press allowed for the dissemination of stories, allowed for the dissemination of images. We don't think we're inundated with images, but, but people in the medieval period could only see them in churches, maybe on facades of orna uh, orn ornated buildings, but they didn't really live with images to the extent that we live now or that they became later on. These are the first mass-produced images. The print allows for, for that. So the bishop immediately 
took advantage of the printing press and began to disseminate the news of this new martyr uh, uh, killed by Jews. And here you have uh, one of the, um, uh, oops, sorry, here, broadsides showing his supposed martyrdom. And here you have the narrative that was published in, uh, written and published on April 4th. Simon's body is found on, April tw uh, on March 26th. And here you have a broadside showing him as a relic with pilgrims uh, uh, coming in. Um, the, the story of Simon uh, clearly developed a language of iconographic language in the story and is also important in the history of the printed book because it is the first example of when the text and the image are in correspondence with, with each other. It produced, this is the first book that is published in the, in the history of printing that has on the page what the text says is illustrated on the side. And it's not just generic image of, you know, crucifixion of Jesus or some saint, but it actually shows what is, uh, what is said. So that 12-page book uh, had 12 such folios facing each other, and each of them had text and image. I won't be showing you the text, but it shows the whole story, the whole narrative uh, through text and images. So here is the supposed martyrdom. Here is Simon's body. Uh, here is the uh, discovery of Simon's, um, the Simon's body with Jews uh, showing it to the Christian authorities. Then you have the site of pilgrimages, his body on the altar, and the execution of Jews uh, in, uh, in the aftermath of the, of the trial. Uh, this book was published three days after Pope uh, Sixtus IV um, uh, sent his envoy to investigate the whole trial because he heard the stories, but he also, as a pope, knew that popes had condemned such accusations, and he was also nervous about fake relics and potential idolatry and potential problems that might be, might be taking place. But the people in Trento wanted to make that story known and visible. Um, the Pope con uh, con condemned the, uh, the accusation and prohibited naming Simon a, a, a Martin and a Beatus, a blessed uh, or eligible for being uh, venerated. Uh, still, despite these prohibitions, uh, the bishop didn't stop and, and kept promoting the, the cult with printed materials, with investing in art, poetry, songs, tales, uh, uh, art in churches, printed materials, and so on and so forth. And importantly, very an avid reader, a consumer of these <coughs> newly published books, he realized the power of print and power of, of books. So he worked to insert Simon into um, history books that were being published at the time, uh, world history books uh, from creation until the moment they are, they are found. And here is an example of uh, one of the earliest insertions of the Simon story uh, in this uh, very important work by uh, Jacob Philippe Foresti of Bergamo uh, that traces the history of the world from creation until uh, 1485, which is when it was, uh, it was uh, printed. Here you have an image, and that was an image that was used for the advertising of this event. Now ubiquitously, now if you Google blood libel, if you Google quote unquote ritual murder, uh, that image will come up. Um, that comes from a, a chronicle, well-known chronicle, the Nuremberg Chronicle, published in 1470, uh, 1493. And over there is a pirated edition from 1475 that also, uh, from 14, uh, sorry, I always transpose things, from 1497. And, uh, and eventually, when Simon becomes part of the understanding of world history and he's inserted in these major chronicles, uh, over 100 years later, Rome recognizes the cult 
uh, and inserts him into a liturgical calendar, the Martyrologium Romanum uh, in 1583. An important moment for anybody who knows anything about history, this is after the Gregorian uh, uh, reform of the calendar, which is also uh, leading to the reform of the, ca of the liturgical calendar. And here has, Simon has one line on March 24th uh, that in, in, in Trent, um, a boy was cruelly, um, uh, cruelly killed by, uh, by Jews. Um, so that is the recognition of, de facto recognition of the cult that before that, as I call it, was a rogue cult, unrecognized cult by, the, uh, by, by, by Rome. It was finally abolished in 1965, but its traces remain uh, across the town. And I spoke with someone earlier who visited Trent and, and, and so many of these things. So again, going back to these maps, uh, libels before 1475, uh, largely known from literary sources, not necessarily trials of Jews, occasional trials, and if they did take place, they result in very strong uh, condemnations from both uh, uh, secular lay authorities and the, um, the Catholic Church, the popes. And here you have the libels after 1475. Uh, so that is the 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 the, the turning point that makes the story so ubiquitously known because it becomes embedded in, the, uh, in books and in knowledge that is consumed. Not only that, it, re, it um, invents an iconographic language of depicting these, these libels, these lies. Before that, we don't really have any iconographic depictions of these, how Jews are supposed to have done this, this, this uh, uh, supposed crime. Um, but after Simon and the investment that the bishop has made, we begin to see uh, a language. Uh, suddenly, the stories that may have been trans transmitted through either one-line chronicles or rumors or tales carried by pilgrims in the sites that may have resulted in some kind of uh, veneration, uh, now they were imaginable because they were depicted um, visually. So we see three types of depictions. We see the, the so-called martyrdom of, of Simon that is depicting Jews in the act of, of martyrdom, of martyring him. The, body of Simon, the Simon as a victim, bloodied and lying on the altar, and the Simon in glory that replicates the iconography of Jesus uh, uh, after resurrection, including that banner of, of martyrdom that you see. But each of those motifs is disseminated differently in different geographic areas. So in Italy, on the Italian peninsula and in, in what is now northern Italy, it's the Simon and glory that is dominant. So kind of sanitized. And if you look at this, like, well, you really have to look at what's going on. So you can see there's a knife, there's some blood, there's some gory items going on. But the boy is a kind of cute little boy. Um, that's not the case in Northern Europe, over the Arps, in the German areas and in Eastern Europe, you begin to have a focus on the more uh, cruel and gory uh, iconography. So depicting the dead Simon, often accompanied uh, with some anti-Jewish iconography, like here you have the Judensau, the Jewish sow of Jews, uh, and devil uh, in, this, in this act, and, and Simon depicted on top. Um, and uh, the image that I showed you before, so again, this supposed martyrdom in the Chronicle um, of uh, the Nuremberg Chronicle, and ubiquitous uh, uh, Northern, uh, Northern European depictions of uh, various renditions of the same Jews in the act of killing uh, that you see throughout 
uh, throughout centuries. Um, and again, I'm just, just flashing through that. Here is a 19th century uh, depiction of Simon of Trent, and here is an 18th century uh, Eastern European Polish depiction of Trent. So that really de depicts and develops a language that, is, that spreads in the, um, in, in especially in Northern, Northern Europe. Um, the other thing is how these, these become facts, how these stories and lies and rumors become facts. And one of them is the role the uh, printed chronicles take place. So the, the genre of a world history uh, emerges in late, in late medieval period and it sort of talks about the creation of the world and the main events through Bible and post-biblical history until whenever they are written. And then in the print, when print comes in, these chronicles become bestsellers uh, and are, uh, and are in, uh, put in print. And they talk about anything. This is uh, uh, Noah's Ark, by the way, as one of those world events. Uh, but in those chronicles, there are some that are quite voluminous. There are about a dozen of stories about Jews, uh, post-biblical Jews. And they're all negative. Uh, they are talking about Jews being ex expelled from uh, France or other places, being burned or attacked, usually as a punishment for something that they did, did wrong or bad, right? They, uh, they, they kill children, they, they burn, uh, they are burned, or they uh, desecrate things, they pierce uh, sacraments, and so on and so forth. These are the only stories about Jews that happen to be enter, uh, entered into these general history books. So even if you are not an anti-Jewish person, even if you are not looking for stories about Jews, if you're just interested in learning history, that's all you get. So the image of the Jew as the evil, criminally intent per, uh, group is there. And what needs to be done to bring things to justice is to do something bad to Jews, to persecute them, to expel them, to burn them, to plunder them, and so, so on and so forth. Um, this is, a, and, and these are usually one sentence chronicles. One sentence, here's another example, which is interesting. In 1538, this is the first mention of the expulsion of Jews from uh, from Spain. So it takes a long time before it enters the consciousness. But the other story of how facts are made is this story of this, um, of this page. So in tw I mentioned in 1247, Pope uh, Innocent IV issued a, con a very explicit condemnation of these accusations against Jews. Uh, when this monumental history of, uh, of the church was written, um, the, the writer Odorico Rinaldi, who worked in the Vatican archives, included the bull condemning Jews, uh, condemning Christians for, uh, for accusing Jews again, uh, of killing Christian children. And he uh, proceeded with a short introduction that a girl was killed in this town, about, in this French town, and then the Pope issued this uh, this uh, condemnation. The book is volume 13 of a multi-volume, this size, I'm not kidding you, book. Nobody bought it, right? Only maybe monastic libraries bought it, but nobody bought it. So entrepreneurial printers would print, print abridged editions of this work in one volume. So you can buy it and read it at home. What do they get rid of? The primary sources. And they only leave those introductions. So what's left is Jews are accused of killing a, Jew, a, a, a Christian girl. And that enters as a fact of history, not that the Pope condemned it and how. And then these chronicles also include images, always signaling a story related to Jews, usually bigger than the other illustrations, as in this case. Or, or here, this is the story of the Simon of Trent, uh, published in a book, Cosmographia, by Sebastian Münster, 
a Protestant. Just so you are not wondering, is it a Catholic thing? It's not just a Catholic thing. There's a different um, emphasis. Obviously, Sebastian Munster doesn't think that Simon was uh, a, a, a blessed child to be venerated, but he accepted the story. And here we have another example of signaling either the story of Simon or another story about Jews. Here is a story of Jews uh, uh, poisoning wells, uh, and here is a story from Munster of Jews being burned at the, at the stake. So these, uh, these ways, these chronicles signaled for the readers to pay attention. Here is a story about Jews, and as I said, all of them were negative. Here's my um, spreadsheet of trying to connect and figure out where these stories and how they are transmitted. Uh, eventually, a big fact that changes the dynamic of these accusation is the insertion of Simon in this Martyrologium Romanum for the Catholic world, and this essentially uh, ex helps explain this map, not only, but that, uh, because this is in the Catholic areas. And the recognition of Simon as a legitimate cult gives legitimacy to further accusations, and it also m uh, means that the, other, the popes later on are unwilling to issue a condemnation of such accusations. They help behind the scenes. They say, yes, the popes had, uh, had prohibited such accusations, but they are no longer willing or able to publicly condemn such accusations because it would uh, it would challenge potentially the whole liturgical calendar and the whole system of beliefs and saints. And this is 16th century after the Reformation. So the church is unwilling to challenge its own doctrines and beliefs. Um, and uh, again, we've seen these maps of the impact of the recognition of Simon of Trent on the, uh, on the accusations and, uh, and the, the, the fact that they take place in, in, uh, in especially in Eastern Europe. Uh, and, and the first story of Simon enters po in Polish in, for, uh, 14, uh, in 1579. So what, what these chronicles tell you is that what, what George uh, Moss was, say, uh, was saying, that it essentially shows you uh, the development of, a, of culture as a state and a habit of mind. These chronicles and these stories about Jews that feature so prominently the uh, blood libels and uh, these anti-Jewish accusations create a habit of thinking among Christian Europeans of Jews as these killers, as these dangerous uh, uh, people among them. And then they are used in the modern modern times. So, because they are treated as facts. Uh, so the, uh, the, the same stories then enter anti-Semitic works, most notably uh, the Nazi propaganda uh, in preparation and then especially in the middle of the, uh, the so-called final solution. So in 1934, uh, Der Sturmer, which was a, a Nazi uh, popular rag, anti-Semitic rag, um, issued a whole, whole issue devoted to uh, ritual murder. And it is no incident that it was published in 1934 with the images that you will find now familiar of using exactly the images from the early modern works that I showed you is because the Nuremberg Chronicle with this image was published in a facsimile edition after Hitler came to power in 1933. So it reintroduced that iconography for the German readers and for the Nazi propagandists. Not only that, this issue uses all those pre-modern chronicles that mention any kind of anti-Jewish story as proofs and as facts that Jews did this in order to push it as the anti-Semitic propaganda. 
once it entered into the Nazi ecosystem of knowledge, it enters all kind of uh, anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic uh, works of the time. So here you have 1942 issue of a fascist Italian uh, magazine, La Difesa della Razza, which was supposed to be a little bit more highbrow than the Nazi Der Sturmer. And again, you can see the, it takes uh, the images of Simon uh, from these, these images, uh, from the, from the Der Sturmer. Uh, here at the head of the final solution, uh, they issue um, both so-called scholarly works and more po popular works um, in different languages in the areas that, that, that Nazis want to justify the, uh, their um, uh, genocidal policies. And again, you can see the images that I showed you earlier from the 15th and 16th century that were published north, in northern uh, Europe. And that Nazi iconography and the Nazi transmission of the pre-modern act enters the current ecosystem of neo-Nazi and white supremacist uh, knowledge, and that is, you can see, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the web, and also in the uh, Middle Eastern um, anti-Semitic and anti-Israeli uh, iconography in the cartoons. And here you have, obviously, that basin and the children in this way. And that's the, 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 where the, the shooter in Poe gets his knowledge. He is not doing scholarly research in early modern chronicles. He is reading the neo-Nazi uh, white supremacist websites, which take uh, their sources from the Nazi publications, which in turn take their sources from the early modern chronicles that I've been discussing. So other lessons to be learned as I'm wrapping up. Leadership matters. It's not always effective, but it matters. We've seen it in terms of quantitative and qualitative uh, type of accusations when the popes and uh, lay authorities explicitly condemn these accusations. It gives tools for those who want to uh, defend Jews or to, who want to make a statement that authorities are condemning it. Again, it doesn't always work, but it is a tool. Diverse sources of knowledge matter. This map can be explained not only by the, um, the story of Simon of Trent, but also by the literature that was, uh, that was uh, available to the readers in these various area, areas. In Germany, though you had these anti-Jewish uh, representations of Jews as killers in various, uh, in various chronicles, you also had a literature that explained to German readers Jewish ceremonies and, and rites. These were not neutral sources, they were polemical anti-Jewish sources, but they were based on Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish uh, sources, Hebrew sources, often written by Christians who were familiar with them, who were able to debunk those, those myths. So for instance, um, Johannes Buxdorf, in his uh, description of Jewish ceremonies, he describes the Passover rituals, which were often served as a justification for anti-Jewish libel, saying that Jews prepare the matzah and they only use water and flour, nothing else. And he adds, and it doesn't taste good. Um, but, but he, so he doesn't have to explicitly say, oh, and they don't put any blood in it because he just can say this water and, and flour and that, that explains that. In Italy, the Italian writers were using Jewish sources to prove the truths of Christianity. And in fact, they found that these accusations were um, detrimental to the efforts of converting Jews. Uh, the, it, the, the Italian Catholic policy was try to convert uh, Jews. But in Eastern Europe, in Poland, the literature that was available for consumption was only the literature that was based on these chronicles. So only the anti-Jewish stories were available to readers if they wanted to read anything about Jews. They couldn't read about Jewish ceremonies, rituals, or how to convert Jews. They were only reading about Jewish cruelties and other 
uh, other such stories. The other lesson to learn is that visual culture matters. And I'm sure you, all, you think about the role of memes and that kind of, uh, the power of those. But the fact is that in Italy, this, this iconography made a difference uh, uh, versus the iconography that is disseminated in Northern, uh, Northern Europe. And the final point I want to make is that there was no uninterrupted line uh, between these stories that we, uh, we've seen from the medieval early modern period until now. They uh, reemerge and are, are used and sometimes uh, in, in introduced by scholars in a scholarly context in very specific moments in time. So national uh, um, historiographies that emerged in the 19th century began to pr uh, publish sources. And among those sources were often these anti-Jewish stories. And they end up part of these narratives, casting Jews as these dangerous others. The other thing is uh, that these uh, sources also emerge, uh, re-emerge at the time of 19th century anti-Jewish accusations that resurface with the political and racial anti-Semitism. So, so many of the, of the, of the uh, primary sources about the pre-modern stories are in fact reproduced and published both by anti-Semites and by defenders of Jews in the 19th century in the aftermath of these, of these trials, like in Tisa Eslar or, um, or in, uh, in, other, uh, in other places, including the papal bulls that were defending Jews against that and the resurgence of interest in Simon of Trent as a proof, again, that Jews, in fact, were doing this. In Russia, the Bailey's affair led to the creation of all kinds of primary sources about these different accusations, trial records, and so on, which are now lost due to war. And finally, a very important work by Cecil Roth that, that publishes a, a 1759 uh, report that was, uh, that was produced by, uh, by the um, uh, Holy Office of the Inquisition uh, stating that Jews did not do such things was published in 1935 as a response to Der Sturmer. So this kind of polemic response and the use of pre-modern sources came in very specific moments of, uh, of, uh, of, of historical events. And that, again, is the, uh, we, we're also living in this moment now with resurgence of anti-Semitism that, that people are looking at some of the histo hist longer history of that. So I'll stop here. Thank you. for a really rich and fascinating oh. lecture. Um, I guess happy to take questions. There is uh, someone going around with a microphone, so if you just put your hand up, uh, we'll get to you uh, as soon as we can. Thank you very much for a very interesting and illuminating talk. Um, I would be interested to know more about the emergence of this blood libel before Norwich and in 1940. Do you see like any connections to the uh, Christ killer myth, for instance, but also to like ancient Greece um, uh, legends about Jews sacrificing uh, Greeks uh, and, and all these other stories which are uh, around? Um, so yes, yeah, so the Greek uh, the, the the Greek story is there, but it never uh, is mentioned and resurfaces in this. And we know as scholars about it. Uh, but there's no connection with that, with, with those medieval stories. There's, there's no documentable connection. And if somebody finds it, I'd be happy. Uh, I would be very interested to see it. Uh, but when the stories emerge in 12th century um, with the first narrative uh, at the, being written in the second half of the 12th century about the supposed death of of uh, William of Norwich, whose body was found in, 14, in 1144. The narrative is written in the, probably finalized in the 1180s, so decades after his death. 
Um, and it is, it is actually lost, and it resurfaces in a smaller version in the 16th century that is then published in a printed book and enters circulation. So he kind of enters circulation late in the, in the century. But why did it, em did it emerge in that, in that time? Why, why 12th century? Uh, why these stories begin to emerge in that time? Uh, so there are a couple of reasons. One is that we sh see shift in this period uh, in the veneration of Jesus from Jesus the God in this resur resurrected form that you, you see in um, much of the sort of almost, if you, if you conjure up the Byzantine iconography of Jesus as, the, as God, on, even on the cross, but very clean, very kind of triumphant, to the, uh, Jesus as the suffering man. Uh, and, and the shift in liturgy over uh, Easter to focus on the passion of, rather than resurrection of Jesus. Once you introduce the motif of the passion and the suffering of Jesus, uh, there is more emphasis on, uh, on more, Jews begin to play a more role in it, and it becomes, uh, it, it becomes more negative and detrimental rather than resurrection and the salvation, right, in that, in that story. And you also have, this is what Sarah Lipton's wonderful book, um, Dark Mirror, documented, that in 1160s, you have the development, and again, in a very specific theological moment, of uh, anti-Jewish iconography uh, and the Jewish nose. And that is, again, um, trying to teach Christians to worship this humiliated, bloody Jesus rather than the triumphant God. And saying that if you don't worship him, then you are like Jews. So Jews who rejected him, Jews who killed him. So that story becomes, and iconography begins to reflect Jews as killers at that point. So it's not that the idea of Jews as killers is a new idea. We see it, Augustine talks about it in the fifth century and others have, have talked about it, is that in the 12th century, it's iconographically being depicted. So it becomes more visually important and visible to Christians and they begin to think about Jews in those terms. And the reason why Gavin Langmore, who taught down the road in, in Stanford, thought that this is an, uh, you know, this reads like an invention of, an, uh, of, of the blood label myth, is, and it sounds very familiar, but it sounds familiar because it uses the liturgical language. The story of William of Norwich uses the liturgical language of Jesus rather than the invention of the, of the, of the story in such a way. So it, it, it's that moment of, of transformation in Christian, uh, in Christian um, uh, liturgy and worship and, and, and focus of, on worship. So I'm going to assume you've heard about QAnon. Yes. And what is concerning to me is that most of having read a lot of that, I actually lost a friend to it. So what's concerning to me is that QAnon is a repackaging, apparently, of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion mixed with some other stuff, mixed with the blood libel that Hillary Clinton and Tom Hanks are drinking the blood of kids instead of the Hollywood elite liberals, globalists, cabal, right. whatever you want to whatever code words are using for him, so I'm wondering if you could comment on how, like, how this has come from there to here. Yes, uh, uh, yes, you're right. And uh, it, uh, QAnon and people who, who promote that also use a, a kind of more neutral language, right? So not talking, oh, Jews do it, right? They will, uh, what is it, Cromwell, something, therapy? Adrenochrome, right? It's sort of scientific language, this, and they, and of course the liberal elites and, and things like that that is coded uh, often to uh, to code Jews in it. Uh, but it is also an entry to anti-Semitism. That is, people will then start googling this, and they end up in 
Oh, oh, Jews did it historically. Look at that, right? So, so even though people, maybe like the readers of early modern chronicles, don't start on the anti-Jewish note or don't necessarily know about it, once they enter and start investigating, they end up on the anti-Semitic trail in that way. But it's definitely using that trope. And it's, again, and when you look at the ima images that have been circulating, uh, they are uh, taking it from their Sturmer and from the Nazi uh, publications. There, somebody contacted me and said, do you know this image? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't this one that everybody can find, but an, but a, an obscure image. And it, sure enough, it comes from one of the Nazi publications. Uh, thank you. So, kind of following on the previous question, um, so, and I'm wondering how effective uh, polemics against this is. I would count your book as part of that, um, and the example you gave of Cecil Roth and even, even the popes at certain times, and I'm wondering how um, important, effective those are, and how much that has to do with just truth-telling or, in some sense, uh, what you've talked about. It, it, is that it's kind of like, why does this become popular? And what kind of counter arguments can be effective? Yeah. It's a, I saw it because as I was writing the book, that was my kind of, oh, it's so depressing because people are essentially reading what they are reading and believing the sources they are reading. So it's not that counter arguments were not known, right? The Pope's stated it, the emperor stated it, there were other writers who were stating it. It's not that it was not known. But uh, once it entered certain, what people considered authoritative uh, sources of knowledge, they believed those sources of knowledge. And there was a, one, a wonderful uh, quote that I have in the book that I found uh, well, one of the uh, anti-Jewish writers says, well, who do you believe, the fathers of the church or the rabbis? So if the rabbis bring you the pope's uh, condemnation, but you have these authoritative lives of saints or these other chronicles that are respected, who do you believe, them? And maybe they forged it, right? And, and that's why I said the lesson learned is the diverse sources of knowledge that blunted this, this mes message. Uh, otherwise, it's what you know, scholars today and sociologists today have confirmation bias. You, be you believe what you believe and the facts that support your beliefs and any counterfacts, you always find a way to discount them as you know, who do you believe, the church fathers or the, or the rabbis. You mentioned that like it, there is a palpable difference in the iconography, uh, iconography of um, Italy focusing more on the glory as opposed to the Northern Europe's like emphasis on the, the torture. And I was wondering, like, can you elaborate more on how that form of anti-Semitism manifested in Italy as opposed to Northern Europe? Um, so in Italy, you do not have until the modern period that kind of virulent demonization of Jews. And one of the reasons is that the, the principal goal of the, of the church, which was a very important dominant power, was to convert Jews. Even creating ghettos in Italy was in order to, cre to, to convert Jews, to make them realize that the reason that they're suffering and being uh, put in these discriminatory uh, uh, positions is because they rejected Christ, but if they convert, all these restrictions will end. And that was the primary goal. There were the, the, uh, and, and in Northern Europe, that was not necessarily the issue, it, and in, in Poland as well. It was to discourage Jewish-Christian contacts. It was to create uh, rifts and animosity. And, and that's, that's, that's the main difference. The other difference is also, 
I, the number of Jews, there are many fewer Jews in Italy than there are in, in Northern Europe, in the German lands, and then in Eastern Europe. And then the other thing is that it's, it's a longer history of iconography, of looking what is consumed, what is produced, and you have much more um, negative, again, portrayals of Jews, um, the scenes of Jews uh, during crucifixion in Northern Europe, and also circumcision of Jesus. Much more malevolent kind of depiction of Jews as circumcised in Northern Europe. Uh, but also the anti-Jewish iconography develops in Northern Europe, not in Southern Europe. So, so that's what you, what you have, these differences. And the first time where uh, I saw uh, the replication of these negative stories in Italy was in the second half of the um, 18th century. And where they get this information from? From a book written by a Polish writer, a Polish Dominican friar who wrote in, in Latin. So, so again, it sort of gets reintroduced in a different way. And then, of course, it takes more root, but, but it really is the focus on, on conversion. And that is detrimental. If you want to bring people into faith, you're not demonizing them because they will reject you. Thank you so much.